Well, good morning, RK. Good morning. It's great to be here. Is Dale here, by the way? No, he must be working. Do you know, I had the pleasure of, if ever you get a chance to speak to Dale, I had the pleasure of sitting in a meeting uh, on Monday night on behalf of RK. And I, I have a very good, my, my talk is about honoring people today, um, or the fifth commandment. If ever you get a chance to speak to Dale, give him your regards. I had the pleasure of sitting in a meeting uh, with the manager of Hope House, and they couldn't speak highly enough of Dale, so give him your, a big slap in the back, will you please? So he is, uh, he's doing such a good job there. Now, when Steve asked me to speak about the fifth commandment, would you speak in the fifth commandment? I said, it would be an honor and a privilege. And then I said, yes, I want to speak about the fifth commandment. That's about honoring your father and your mother. And then I said to myself, oops. Ah, there's more to this than meets the eye. And before I, before I get into the nitty and the gritty of this, uh, I looked and people said to me, oh, sorry, I won't be there when you're speaking. And then something even worse happened. Jim McGlade said he wouldn't be here. And that's my interpreter. Because <laughs> I'm... Some of you might think I'm speaking in tongues because I'm from Northern Ireland. So it's going to be a little bit difficult. You're just going to have to refer to Kathleen. And then that's even worse because I have a chance of speaking far too long. So she'll, and she might look at, you with this, look at me with disdain, you know, and um, I know that look. I learned it very quickly when I started going out with my wife. Uh, <laughs> And, um, oh no, here he goes again. And uh, why use a sentence when a paragraph will do? And uh, so hopefully I will keep this as brief as I can. So let's look at this meaning of the word honor first. Literally it means to show esteem for one deserving of respect, attention, or obedience. Now I'm going to use my trusted old Amplified Bible for preaching. This is the one I use for preaching as well, thumbed and, and everything. And it's um, the fifth commandment, if you look at it in Exodus 20, uh, chapter 20, it reads this in the Amplified Bible, regard, treat with honor, due obedience and courtesy your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God gives you. So we're going to look at it more closely. And it looks, we're going to look at it in three different sections. One is patriarchal, two is conditional, and three is universal. So here we go. Firstly, the patriarchal sense. We have covered a series of commandments, the first four, and Steve finished on the fourth commandment last week. And he gave me some wonderful feed-ins into this one. And the emphasis that we must demonstrate in the first four is that God is our only true living God. And our relationship to him is through Christ alone. Steve, can you please show me the first slide? What has a tree got to do with any of this? I can see the look of disdain from Kathleen already. <laughs> now, as you know, I love trees. Now, look, Platy Cladu Sorientalis, Arborvitae, the tree of life. One of the pleasures I had in life was to show people trees. Now, what I want to tell you about this one is, I had, one of the pleasures I had was to take a group of Japanese um, tourists around the collection I was to curate for 17 years. I had to have a Japanese interpreter with me. I showed them a hundred, this is a very ancient tree on um, Mount Fuji in Japan. 
right? But the tree I showed them was 100 years old in a collection I had of this particular tree. And when I showed these Japanese students the tree, they all went silent. The interpreter, I, I explained all about it in my English, my Northern Irish English. And, they, and the interpreter just went very slow. And then they, and they all just went silent. And then the Japanese interpreter said to me, ah, this is a sacred tree to us. And I asked why. I said, well, we have five sacred trees. And this is the most, the second most sacred tree to us. Next slide, please. You see, the seeds are held in these wonderful shaped cones. And they have, when they die, they, most Japanese people, when they die, they are cremated. And they put them, their, their ashes and urns in shaped like these seed cones. Next slide, please. A little bit of fun here. Platycladus orientalis morganii. Oh. But you see, Platycladus clad with plates. I like to put it, if you put Christ first, everything else goes right. Everything else goes in order. You see, you can't help put Christ first. Like Steve was saying about the other commandments, you put God first. Put God first and everything else slots into place. It's like putting all your dishes in order. In the dishwasher. Who stacks the dishwashers in your house? Get on your ball. They're a complete confusion to me. I never get it right. But I get my trees, right? <laughs> Therefore, by giving this fifth commandment, at this point, God specifically highlights how keeping it benefits both you and all of society. It only starts a series of six commandments that shows us how we should love other people starting from our earliest formative years. Honoring our Heavenly Father, so patriarchal, if we honor our Father, we also honor God. In a way, this fifth commandment brings the sections of the first four and the last six together. Since God reveals himself as our loving Father, no father deserves honor as much as he does. Yet the Bible also shows that humanity and even those chosen to be God's people have often failed in showing an honor and respect to our creator God. We have mucked up. We destroy creation. We destroy everything we touch by just being human. And God pointed out this much too common problem. In Malachi 1 verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? This fifth commandment also helps us to see how learning respect and honor in the family setting helps prepare us to show honor to your ultimate father. I said right at the very beginning that I had the privilege to be brought up in a Christian home. 
So it is my turn to honor my father and mother both who have gone to glory. Hallelujah. My father just over two years ago, at the ripe old age of 96, the day before Harlan and Wolf shipyards closed for good. Next slide, please, Rich. To a very iconic picture. Well, you, whatever, has anybody ever flown into George Best, um, George Best Airport in Belfast? Yeah. That's the first thing you should see, isn't it? Sorry, that's the first thing you see. <laughs> Not my hand, sorry. <laughs> my, uh, on my bucket list is the abseil of those. <laughs> that's on my bucket list. I've abseiled off many other things. I've abseiled off the Fourth Road Bridge, the Rail Bridge, sorry. I've abseiled off the Sydney Harbour Bridge. I've abseiled off the Sydney, Sydney Opera House. I've abseiled off the tallest tree in Kent. I've abseiled off many, many trees. Never have sailed off these yet, but I want to. <laughs> they were built. They, they, they go over the, the Titanic dock. Yeah. Right. They're still in use. They have to be. But they're a bit of a white elephant now. Harley and Wolfman busted the day after my father passed away. sadly. But let me tell you about Harlan Wolf. Used to employ 40,000 people, but nobody that was a Roman Catholic was allowed to work there. It was blitzed during the war because, as history would tell you, they left the lights on on Rathlin Island. The old Roman Catholics left the right lights on, on, on Rathlin Island because that guided in the bombers into the shipyard. That's what I was told, anyway, as a boy. Next slide, please. This is my mother's family. The Watsons, or Millikins. They were born pre-partition. Nanny Watson, my favorite grandmother, lovely lady, born in a farm, family of 18, when her brother married, when her brother married, uh, he was the eldest son, got the farm, she had to go into service in the city. That was it. So she met my, 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 grandf my grandfather, Papa. He was a bare knuckle fighter. Could have been a champion. Then he met Jesus. He had to give up fighting. Didn't like violence. However, he had an interesting version of uh, theology. He worked in the railways, worked in the steel yards. And then he, uh, name was Samuel. He was a foreman on the railways, worked in the, in the gangs, you know, and all that sort of stuff. He had a terrible, one guy would give him terrible cheek and give him a good slap and slap in the cheek. And he says, right, hit me that side. So he hit him that side. He says, right, I've turned the other cheek and he lamped him one. He says, right, you've lamped me. <laughs> I've turned the other cheek, but that was his theology. <laughs> but he never gave him truck again. He was a lovely man, though. He taught me uh, a lot of things. He had a fantastic singing voice. When you heard him sing the, the hymns in the mission halls, and you heard him singing to his heart's content. Next slide, please. It's my father's family. Again, born pre partition. They, but they lived on the border after partition. My dad, born in 1922, age of 16, decided to form 
with lots of his friends, a male voice testimony choir at the age of 16. <laughs> his mother, sa mother said he loved, he loved tennis. His mother said, Prince, Apostle Paul didn't play tennis. That was her theology. She was miserable. Oh, dear. <laughs> she was miserable. Anyway, he, he formed the Male Voice Testimony Choir. And at when the, the age of 86, I had the privilege of taking him back to Northern Ireland to celebrate the 70th anniversary of that, the forming of that choir. He was blind then, sadly, and I escorted him to the Park Avenue Hotel where Kathy and I are at our wedding reception to see, and he was only six of the founder members still alive, to see him sing still the, 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 good, old, the good old mission hymns. Mum, fantastic baker, very interesting, but a terrible snob. But she was always cooking dinner for all the grandparents on a Sunday. She was never at church. Having said that, it was a privilege to be brought up in a Christian home. There was hardly any time to do any homework or have fun except on a Saturday or school holidays. We were always at church. On reflection, that was good for my spiritual well-being. But when I left home at 16 to start what turned out to be my dendrological career, I felt I had been released. It was weird. And some things really started to confuse me. But more of that later. Jesus often repeats this commandment, often in the Gospels. In Matthew 15, verse 4, he says, For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And in Matthew 19, verse 19, he says, honor your father and your mother. Jesus himself honored his own father in total obedience through death on the cross. We sang about that only recently, just a few minutes ago. And in John's gospel, you read in John 29, verse 13, while in the agony of that death, the most cruel, barbaric death ever designed, he honored his earthly mother by, in those pangs of death by saying this, to the Apostle John, take care of her. And John promised to do so. I have nothing against my parents. Yes, it was a hard life. Yes, it was a strict life. But it was a godly life. This commandment, secondly, comes with a promise. And thank God it does. Paul, when writing to the church at Ephesus, reminds them of the fact that this is the first commandment with a promise. In Ephesians 6, verse 2 and verse 3, he writes this. Honor, esteem, and value your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. No one ever told me that the Christian life would be easy. I thought it was brilliant when I left home because the whole world opened up to me. But no one ever told me the Christian life would be easy. I know anyone that tells you that it would be is lying. Forty-five years or more walking this path of the Christian life to the best of my ability with God as my guide and with a wonderful wife of 41 years, I can honestly say this, it is the best life I have ever had. Have you never read Isaiah 43 verse 1 and 2? But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. You will not be scorched. And you will not be burned by the flames. Amen. 
But then there's the other thing, obedience. Obey your parents. Now, there's not many children here in this meeting, but sometimes it's difficult to obey your parents, isn't it? Obey your parents. Paul also adds to this in Colossians 3.20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And this is where I come to this business of the sectarianism I was brought up in. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. So as we go through this series, we can see all of God's commandments are given for our benefit. But this one is especially highlighted by God for the blessings that it brings for the individual, the family, and society in general. Now, I know across society today, and possibly within this room, it may be difficult to honor one's father or mother for all sorts of reasons. For example, how can you honor a father who one week would be seen striking your mother in a fit of temper as you cowered behind the sofa yet would be the life and soul of the party if he had a good one in the horses and brought home chocolates the next week for everyone. Yet that same person encouraged my wife as a child to go to church in Sunday school. I never met that man, nor knew him. He died the day that England won the Football World Cup. But I will never forget his wife, Elsie, Kathleen's mum, in my view, never had a judgmental bone in her body because when she met Christ shortly after she was widowed, did she ever hold spite or bitterness towards anyone who wronged her past or present because she loved her Lord so much. Christ teaches a lot about this on this subject after what we all know and love as the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, we read this. For if you forgive people their trespasses, is, is their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, the reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Nail it to the cross and leave it there. As a Christian, no matter how hard it is, part of the rich reward of this commandment's promise is tied up in the grace given to us through God, giving of himself in the form of his son Jesus, enabling us to nail all our hurts, our anger and disappointments to the cross once and for all. Leave it there. Let it go. Don't leave. keep taking it back so that we can honor him the best we can. And finally, it doesn't finish there. The commandment is universal. It's universal. And here's where the tricky bits come in, for me personally. Honor all people. A smooth functioning society and happy relationships are based on respect and obedience to authority. It is much easier if we learn this early in life without requiring the harsh taskmasters of boot camp, prison, or being fired. So let's come back to the time I left home at the age of 16 to start what become my dendrological career. Now, it didn't start very well. <laughs> A little bit of background first, and this is from a Northern Irish perspective. In my home, certain TV programs were, not, were even taboo. Doctor Who? Well, and I, I, interesting, I had a time away in Wales recently with my brother. He wasn't even allowed to watch t Doctor Who in our house. I was, he wasn't, I don't know why that was. But then I was a twin. Yes, there's two of me. <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh oh <laughs> no, my, I have a non-identical twin. I'm the better looking one. <laughs> Being brought up in quite a strict Christian home, no TV on Sundays except no for songs of praise. 
There wasn't really time to watch it anyway, as I was always out on to, to, to do with something with church. Six times on a Sunday generally. A good Protestant upbringing in a Presbyterian church. Six times most Sundays. Now I went to a school, my secondary school was called Regent House. I hated it, absolutely loathed it. And I failed miserably at school because when I had a dream of the boy at 14, seeing boy, a man planting trees in a wood in the Navarre Forest Park, I said, that's what I want to do for a living. I want to be working trees in a forest. And I went to see my careers master at school and I hadn't a clue what forestry was. Not a scooby. <laughs> you probably don't know what that terminology is, scooby. And so I was totally, I, so I just drifted through my O-levels and did rubbish. So I had to go back and do my O-levels again. But I wrote to the Northern Ireland Forest Service, it was known as then, and five weeks into my retaking my O-levels, I got a letter from the Northern Ireland Forest Service and got a job. Yay! God was looking after me. But I was posted. I was posted to a place in the middle of nowhere, a little place called Pomroy, right on the border of the Northern Ireland. <laughs> the no knows exactly where it was. Now, the border of Northern Ireland, if you want, if you want, I could have done, I could have done this. I could have stood there in Northern Ireland and there in Southern Ireland. There you go. And that was the border. And there I stood there for six months. Six months. Anyway, so halfway through, that's, that, that's where I was. And I became a trainee forester, posted to Pomroy Forestry Training School. Nanny Watson, who was born on a farm, loved it. I was going back to the land. I was her darling. I was going back to the land. Do you know what my first job was? I've told some of the guys this already. My first job was in the Northern Ireland Forest Service was to clean the main sewage drain from the forestry school to the cesspit. What's that got to do with dendrology? Because the guys were testing my metal. A townie coming to the woods. I was working along, alongside Roman Catholics and enjoying their company. That was confusing. I actually enjoyed their humour and quite liked them. <laughs> Worse still, my ganger was a prod. He was a Protestant and had paired me with a Roman Catholic for training and work experience. So what should I do about that? What should I tell my parents when I was home at the weekend? Oh dear, what should I tell them? Should I lie? Should I honor them and should I tell the truth? In truth, I told them nothing. Due to the troubles, there was a bus strike. Dad was too busy at church to pick me up, so I stayed with Nanny's relatives in the country close to Pomeroy. I worked in the farm. That was even better. I was our darling yet again. I ended up feeding cattle and sheep all weekend. The next weekend, when I was able to get home, all I said was that I was working with a group of about 12 blokes, some of whom have taken me under their wing to look after me, which they have been asked to do by the head forester. This was the truth. This honored them and honored my parents. But it did Fill, fill me with confusion because the stupidity and hatred that Kathleen and I experienced, not so much by me in those days, sadly still exists today, particularly since Brexit. So praying for anyone in authority over us in society or in any other way is another way this commandment affects us. In Romans 13 verse 1, Paul writes this, let Every person in, be loyally subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. By his permission, his sanction, and those that exist do so by God's appointment. In Proverbs 8 verse 15, 
By me kings reign and rulers decree justice. In closing, therefore, and particularly as we are in this great time of transition as a church, can I encourage you to pray continually? Last slide, please, Rich. In closing, therefore, and particularly as we are in this great time of transition as a church, can I encourage you to pray continually for the leaders? Can all the leaders that are here please stand? Can all the leaders that are here please stand? Can I just encourage you just right now? Just, in fact, just stand with your leaders. Reach out your hands to them. Can I just encourage you to pray for our leaders right now? Continually. Because they're just, jugg- they just trying to juggle the rigors, keeping this church together. Without a main figurehead or leader along with the needs of their, needs of their family and their jobs, which is a really tall order. Pray that God will sustain them. Provide them with wisdom. And that family time and jobs will not be impoverished by the fair focus on their service to you and their work for RK. By doing so, I believe you will be keeping and following this commandment in its fullest sense as given by God all those years ago to Moses, but is just as valid today and as ever. Amen. Thank you, Dad.